So now these are skills. This is treatment planning. This is imagination. This is creativity. This is now looking into self care. So then you can be at peak performance. But you can't be at peak performance if you're not taking care of yourself. And that's one of the things that I always say is, is that why do we tell our patients not to wait until they're symptomatic, right? We say this all the time. Don't wait until you're symptomatic to come and see us because at that point it's too late or it's gone too far. But why do we allow ourselves to become symptomatic before we actually need to make a change? Welcome to Investment Grade Practices Podcast, where we believe private practice dentists deserve to get the lifestyle today while building an asset for tomorrow. Join your host, Victoria Peterson, to design the practice of your dreams and secure your financial independence. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Investment Grade Practice. I'm Victoria Peterson, your host, and today I'm super excited to be with Dr. Jessica Metcalf. She is multi-talented, um, amazing human. I got to know you, Jessica, at Dental Festival at the Dentistry's Got Talent um, competition, where you took first place. So my first question to you is, how heavy is that belt? <laughs> Well, it's heavy enough that it put me overweight <laughs> with my luggage, <laughs> mm. um, but it, it was so good. I still, I'm, I remember looking at the videos afterwards and just in disbelief when my name got called <laughs> and then a very proud moment at the same time, because I feel like we can't talk about some of the things that I did talk about. And now that I walked away from winning it. It's that we are now able to continue to have these conversations. I love it. And so for those of you joining us on this podcast, Dr. Jessica is an incredibly brilliant dentist and clinician. She works in the field of oncology, dental oncology, and uh, the discipline of, I would call it medically compromised or complex care. And you teach a lot of classes about that on how to treat the medically compromised patients. And I have so much respect for you. And I look forward to bringing that work forward. Um, today, though, what I'm really super excited about is this duality that you have. Of not only are you an amazing clinician and a brilliant scientific mind, but your um, compassionate heart has been opened through your own journey. And when I look at investment grade practices, you know, the I in the investment is really how am I investing in myself as a dentist, as an owner, as a human? And there's so many skills to develop to successfully build and grow a dental practice. And today, what we're talking about is your topic that you won at a Dentistry's Got Talent, which is perfectionism and burnt out and mental um, performance. So maybe today we'll get into some of those soft skills, you know, and why self-care is so important to creating peak performance. It's like a tool in your tool belt. And yet every dentist I ever interview, we do lots of research, right? And they'll say, yep, meeting my goal. My team is good. How are you at, how are you at your own self-care? Like on a scale of one to 10, Jessica, I will say that they typically rate themselves below a three. Almost every dentist I've ever surveyed rates themselves at a below a three, like self-care is somehow a nice to have, but not a must have. So help us, show us what you teach and how you help doctors really understand the value of this. I want to start with the fact that you had said soft skills, and that's where we're already looking at them in a negative way. And then when we look at self-care, that's why it's ranked so low is because we don't see it as something that we need to be spending time on. So what if we actually changed soft skills to essential skills? Ah. Right? So now these are skills. This is treatment planning, this is imagination, this is creativity, this is now looking into self-care so then you can be at peak performance. But you can't be at peak performance if you're not taking care of yourself. And that's one of the things that I always say is, is that why do we tell our patients not to wait 
until they're symptomatic, right? We say this all the time. Don't wait until you're symptomatic to come and see us because at that point it's too late or it's gone too far. But why do we allow ourselves to become symptomatic before we actually need to make a change? And why do you're a dentist? Why do dentists wait so long before they put themselves at the begin at the first of the line? I mean, I'm talking about, you know, just could you take 10 minutes to take a breath before you walk in the house or go to the gym a couple of times a week, even basic self-care? Yeah. Why does it take so long? It's so, and I keep asking this. It's so funny. I keep having so many of these conversations over and over again. And it's almost as if you have to reach a breaking point to be able to make that change because you keep thinking that you can keep going, that you can keep living amongst the stress without sleep. And it gets to that point where then the body and your mind just can't do it anymore. So if we started to implement changes earlier on, with even things like changing how we choose to communicate to ourselves, Ooh. this will then all of a sudden set you up for being able to handle that one comment that comes in in the day or that one procedure or that one patient who's on your list, right? Instead of it turning into the tipping point. Can you give me an example of that? Like how I talk to myself? Mm. So one way that we choose to motivate ourselves, especially as high achievers, high performers to begin with, is we negatively motivate ourselves. Oh, oh, someone works harder than me and someone's smarter than me. So, which means I need to work that much harder. I need to take more CE. I need to work longer hours in order to be able to make up for this lack thereof that I've told myself. And I'm the only one who's told myself this. Oh, do you think that's from selection into, like, is it part of the educational process that we learn to talk to ourselves this way? Yeah. So it starts as early back. So it, there's two parts to this. One, it could have been depending on childhood and that communication from role models or parents or adults in general. And then as we started to make our way through, we started to perform as that high performer. And so you now became the president of a club or were a top athlete or volunteered or had research. And all of a sudden that baseline is now heightened. Then you get to dental school and that baseline is now normalized. And because of that, you are now consistently pushing yourself and pushing yourself. And then when you start to compare, and social media nowadays makes it really easy for us to compare, we then think, oh, well, why am I not taking on the full rehab cases? Or why am I not doing the complicated extractions? And that's where we can kind of spiral into, okay, well, I'm not good enough, or no. I'm not capable, or I shouldn't be the one to do these things. And so we push ourselves and we beat ourselves down. But if we even started with how we changed our own inner dialogue, we can then start to create compassion for ourselves. Wow. Woo. Um, so what's a better inner dialogue? How do high achievers, I know you've got a couple of courses like the imposter syndrome and 90 yeah. days for confidence. What's a baby step you could take Today, so let's say I am that dentist. Um, I'm short staffed because everybody's short staffed. I'm working to drink. My patients are booked out now like six months. Everybody's, but it, it feels like I'm not even productive. I'm just like busy, crazy, exhausted. What's one thing I could tell myself today that would make a difference? Mm -hmm. So, one of the first ones is when you start to create awareness in what you're saying to yourself. So the first is just to pay attention to what that inner voice is saying. Some of us haven't even paid attention to it because it's been on repeat for so long that that's our normal. So now it's creating awareness around it. Then what you wanna do is start to substitute words from the I can'ts to I can, and I know what you're saying is, okay, if it was that easy, <laughs> everyone would be doing it, okay. But yeah. what you can take it is one step further and separate self-doubt from idea doubt. So what does that mean? Self-doubt is where you walk into a situation and say, I suck at doing dentistry. Idea doubt is where you look at that situation and you remove yourself from it. So idea doubt is now, 
getting really specific. So say class two restorative procedure didn't go as well. And you say that margin wasn't good or wasn't done as well as I would have hoped it to be. Mm. That way you're then separating yourself from the situation instead of blaming yourself now. So idea doubt can be energizing. It can help you problem solve. Versus self-doubt can be debilitating. Then the last component of it is is that as you start to substitute your words, as you start to change from self-doubt to idea doubt, you actually have to figure out if you believe it or not. And Mm. that's when you tune into your body and you rank it on a score. So the way that I like to do it is think of the pain scale. Zero being no pain, 10 being the most excruciating pain ever. So zero is your belief, you absolutely, or zero is you don't believe it, 10 is you absolutely believe it. So if all of a sudden that butterfly in your stomach starts to settle down, or the lump in your throat isn't as prominent, or your chest doesn't feel as tight, you're now starting to believe what your inner dialogue is saying. Mm. You can get from a two out of 10 to a three out of a 10, to eventually a five, to a 5.5. It's just those minor steps of getting there. I love that. And that's so powerful too, because how we identify is how we show up. So that's a huge difference taking it in a non-dental way of I'm a smoker versus I'm someone who smokes. Yes, exactly. Because someone who smokes could quit. Someone who smokes could reduce, someone who could make a different choice, but I am, therefore I will be. So you're right, those I am, I suck, I this, those I statements about ourselves are so damaging neurologically because it it hardwires us to then be programmed to do that. Uh, Anytime anytime you have that uncomfortable conversation with a patient or a staff member or a procedure doesn't go as well, you relate that back every single time and your body remembers that every single time. So it's that much easier to slip into that anxiousness. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I'll share with you a quick example of how a leadership changing their mindset changes everything within the company. So within PDA, uh, going through the pandemic with all of our consultants and they're flying all over the world, they're pretty independent, independent thinkers. And then now everybody's in their office and now they're having to learn to work virtually and we're having to learn new things and communicate in a very specific way on legal and financial issues with our doctors so having 30 opinions on how to apply for or should you apply for ppp is probably not a good thing for a consulting firm right and so we got very um, centralized and a little too micromanaged and so that that type of leadership kind of got started feeding into like during pandemic to the point that people were now holding others accountable. I'm going to hold you accountable. And our doctors call us and they'll say, would you hold my team accountable? Will you fix my team? And that phrase has always bugged me. And I didn't figure out until the leadership retreat that you and I were talking about. I was like, that's no longer, that word is no longer in my vocabulary because what I want to hold my people to be is capable. Mm. Oh, so powerful. So powerful. So I got quiet enough and saying, what is happening? People are vying for power or authority, or there's all this right and wrong and blame. And I don't know, you know, dentists, maybe you're listening to this. You've got that kind of drama going on in your practice. But when you hear that, then you have to state back and say, there is a word that's creating this. What is the word? So I kept listening for the word and the word was accountability. And I thought, you know what? What Jessica is doing is really none of my business in terms of holding you accountable. I can only hold me accountable. So then how do I relate to Jessica as a peer or an employee? It's like, man, I want to know that you're capable. And then if you're not, if this is not getting done and it's a capability issue, then I can train it or I can bring it up and say, Hey, did you know that this was part of your role? And I'm consistently not seeing it. And you go, Oh God, I just have no capacity for that. Right? Like I could technically balance a checkbook. (laughs) I actually have a lot of accounting background, but no one in my company is going to let me near QuickBooks (laughs) because I can read the financial spreadsheet. So I've got the capacity, I've got the capability of it, but I don't have the capacity to sustain it. 
So I will share with you in the last week or two weeks, I now have people saying, well, you know what? I feel very capable of getting that done. I know I could get that done by five o'clock. And I had one person say, well, I think I'm just going to do that because that's my comfort zone. It's another example of it. And I said, well, I get that that's your comfort zone, but what if that was really your power zone? And they were like, oh, that's my power zone. I love it. This thing you're bringing up about self-talk and how we label, it really is so powerful. So how do you coach this when you're working with doctors? Because leadership seem, leadership and team retention, that seems to be the number one and number two topics that I see doctors curious about and, and feeling kind of hopeless on finding a solution for because the, the topics are so big. So how do you help doctors through this journey? So a good portion of what I do is really helping individuals break through their self-doubt, their fear, fear of failure, and overworking. And when it starts to build confidence, you can really understand your abilities, your skill set, and how to create priorities in your life. And so by starting with asking yourself, what makes you anxious? What keeps you up at night? What are those Sunday scaries, quote unquote, right? We can then start to really unpack, okay, well, why is this making you nervous? Is it a specific procedure? Is it the conversation that has to happen? Is it how the staff is being managed at this point in time? And it's really starting to get into some of those more specific details that we just as humans don't want to ask ourselves at times. And so when I get there, it can be uncomfortable for the individual to try to process it on their own and kind of work through it on their own. And that's where then the two of us can work together to create a safe space to then ask the questions, ask clarifying questions so that we can think differently. Because it's not that the individual is wrong or that the anxiousness is wrong or that the stress is wrong, right? And we're never going to be free of any of that, right? There's always going to be stressors, whether it's in dentistry or if it's in life that happens, there's always going to be stressors that come up. But if we could figure out how to process them, how to view them differently and how to interpret them in a way that allows us to take back our safety, our vulnerability, and the ability to process it, then it becomes that much easier to still work in a stressful environment, but know that this doesn't define me as who I am, and I don't have to take this home every single night. Wow. Wow. That's so powerful. And, um, I know you're probably seeing the same thing. There's so many more resources. It feels like we're coming out of the closet with this dirty little secret. Yeah. And, and, and the secret is entrepreneurship and clinical dentistry both carry this thread of high achievers, which um, is just a huge destructive self-burnout sort of pace that we impose on ourselves. And, you know, in studying entrepreneurship, you, you see the big success, you know, the guy's got the, the Jaguar and the jet and all of that. But what you don't see on the cover of the magazine are the burnt relationships, you know, the, the divorces, the kids who aren't talking to you, the addictions, the coping mechanisms. And so um, I know for myself, I got in that spiral. I thought I could do it all. Why not? I had um, a consulting firm. It was successful. It had a marketing firm. I had everything I needed to then go build a management platform. So why not buy five dental practices? I bought three on the same day. Can you believe that? Like, who does that? It's like a buy one, get one. You know, it's not the same as buying shoes, right? So within six months, I've got 55 employees who live in another state. Like, and I was going through menopause. So depending on where you're at in your personal body and your life cycle and your hormones and your yeah. family history and your genetics and all of that kind of biochemistry kicks in and you end up, you know, being treated for PTSD. And my mind couldn't even wrap myself around it because I thought, I didn't go to Vietnam. I've never killed anybody. Like that was my definition of, of brain stress was, well, you don't get to 
you don't get to declare that you've got a stressed out brain unless you've murdered. <laughs> and it goes back to exactly our definition of what PTSD looks like, right? And it looks different to every single person. So what does it look like in dentistry? What are some archetypes that you might see? Because this really is a block to your leadership. It's a block to your success. Um, and it doesn't have to be fully PTSD, but on that, on that mental scale of, of stress. So, and that's why I keep saying the word anxiousness, because you may or may not have been diagnosed and sought out uh, professional help in order to receive that diagnosis. And that's completely fine, right? So it's not putting a label on someone, it's understanding, okay, where does that anxiousness come from? So then you can work through it. So regardless if you have an anxiety disorder or panic disorder of some sort or PTSD, it's now understanding, okay, well, how do I understand it a little bit more so then it doesn't become debilitating? And so when I talk about anxiousness and we start to work through, it's really now paying attention to how it starts to come up within you and when does it come up? Yeah. And are there certain triggers? Just similar to the way that we ask our patients at an emergency appointment, right? Now we can start to internally ask ourselves that. Is it specific type of procedures that you really don't want to be doing anymore that kind of set you off, right? Did you have that one case with that one patient? And you can likely already picture it as I'm talking about it, <laughs> right? That comes to mind that you're like, okay, now I'm not going to be able to do this procedure ever again. Right. That doesn't mean that just because that one didn't go as planned doesn't mean that you can't try again. So what can happen at times, and this is, I've worked through with a couple of clients is understanding if you're creating now safety behaviors and what safety behaviors are deliberate actions to help you process and reduce that anxiety. And if when you eliminate that safety behavior, all of a sudden that anxiousness will come up. So let's say you have to look at an x-ray three times and you have to look at medical history twice and you have that process. And when you eliminate one of those things, it's like you can't trust yourself. Mm. And so now it's starting to build back that confidence internally instead of waiting for a patient or a staff member to compliment you. And when you start to build that internal validation, when you start to pay attention to that anxiousness and your stressors, you can really start to curate a dental life that fits you because ultimately that's all it needs to fit is you, right? right. What's the type of dentistry you want to be doing it? And what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Wow. This is so powerful, and and I appreciate you so. We're going to have you back more and more because we don't even have time to get into your clinical chops, which are so meaty. But you know, you brought up a couple of really great points. Is that leadership begins here? It begins with me. And this last piece, I I hope I heard this right. Is that you know, there's a lot of, that you hear in business management. You know, at the speed of trust and get your team to trust you and your pace to trust you. But if I don't trust myself, because if I don't follow this methodically, and I do think that we do, uh, we do search for and the application process helps to elevate people with OCD or Asperger's or we're on, we're all on this OCD spectrum somewhere, or we wouldn't be in this highly specific career choice. You know, it is meant for all of us. I tell my husband, I, I either clean everything down to the light switches or clean nothing at all. I, like there's no in between for me because it's, it's really hard. Yeah. Um, so I choose to have someone else clean the house because it's, it's better for everybody. Um, that, right. So, you know, that, and that works. Yeah. Yeah. But when I do get in here and I, I've, boy, during the pandemic and my Clorox wipes, every door handle, every light switch was just spick and span <laughs> everything we touched. Um, it's really so good to know that there's hope. It's really so fabulous to know that there are easy things, quick things like in um, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, that these feelings of anxiousness that prevent me from being my best, this feeling of anxiousness that causes me not to trust myself, like that could all go away. And then I love the part where you said, then you don't have to wait for others to compliment you. You're not waiting for external validation. And I think that really um, 
it just defines what leadership really is. You know, is this, I'm, I'm in touch with my own inner authority and I trust myself to lead and guide others. So what a, what a beautiful gift you are to our industry. Thank you. Thank you. Those are very kind words. Thank you so much. All right. If our listeners want to learn more about you, Dr. Jessica, how do they get in touch with you? They can send me an email at info at drjessicametcalf.com, or they can check me out on social media under the name The Alchemist Dentist. The Alchemist Dentist. I love it. And we'll get all of that in the show notes. Uh, You're somebody that we definitely need to keep an eye on. You are a rising star, and uh, it won't be long before everybody knows your name. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Investment Grade Practices Podcast. If you find value in this episode, help us spread the word by passing it along to a dental friend, subscribe, and give us a like on iTunes or Spotify. Learn more about building your investment grade practice at ProductiveDentist.com today.